Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Pat, let me start by congratulating you. Congratulating you on your birthday and um, particularly congratulating your wife because when you came here and you said all those good things about your wife, I said, God knows that you are a bad man. <laughs> you know, God wanted to use your wife to cover your badness. And you have done you have done it very well. Madam, thank you very much for taking good care. But I also want to congratulate you for keeping C V L for keeping it going. How many years now has it been going? Fifteen years. It will go another fifty years. When I came in, you said to me that you want to know what is responsible for my youthfulness and all that. And I told you that if you know it and you bottle it, you will not sell. Because the adversaries of a passenger will not buy it from you. And you know there are many. Dan Keller, I want to thank you. You've never disappointed me. And I know you will not. And you know my own borders in terms of bringing up what is good in Africa and in Africans goes beyond the boundaries of Nigeria. And you are a typical example. When Yam Kela was here as the country representative and is interested in becoming the head of UNIDO, he said, well, look, I come from a small country. Nobody will support you. I said, well, Nigeria will support you. And Nigeria supported you, and you got them. Then you are doing so well in UNIDO. And I said to you, you need to come home. I also said to you, don't wait until the last minute. Some people have done that. Come home early enough to be part of the game. I am still keeping my fingers crossed and praying that you will get there because you have something to offer your country and to offer Nigeria, I offer Africa. You talk about the Garden of Eden syndrome. Well, let me tell a joke about that. <clears throat> when God was... Uh, that's the work of saboteurs. <laughs> when God was creating Africa, he got African leaders around. And he started from Egypt. Put the Nile River and all the alluvial soil, and he moved on to Libya. He put what he will put. He moved on, and he came to Nigeria. And when he came to Nigeria, he put two rivers out of the five greatest rivers in Africa. And Archangel Michael and uh, Gabriel, looking on, were surprised. Two big rivers in one country. 
Then he started putting diamond, gold, tin, and all that. Then he put oil and gas on shore and offshore he started putting oil and he wouldn't stop. And Archangel Michael then said, Lord God Almighty, aren't you making a mistake? He said, no, you know I never make a mistake. You wait and see the people I will put there. They will mess them all. They will mess it all up. Uh, and that's what you are saying. That some of our leaders or some of our countries we have messed things up. I don't believe it's because of abundance. No. It's because of what you then mentioned later. You put governance before leadership. I put leadership before governance. We can argue about that. <clears throat> now, there are three very important things and we must get those three right. Leadership, governance, and development. And they are all interrelated. You've talked about leadership that are knowledgeable, that understand the world in which they live in. And that is very, very important. You imagine. Just one example. We had a leader who came from Katsina. I'm not talking of Buario. So because that one is apart. And without mentioning his name, you will know who I'm talking about. <laughs> he ran the affairs of Casino State with what he called K-34. Casino State has 34 local governments. And he brought K-34 to run the affairs of Nigeria. So what do you expect? I would have expected that he would bring N36 to run the affairs of Nigeria. But he brought K34 to run the affairs of Nigeria. And the result is what you had. That is leadership. Or should I say lack of it. And from that goes governance. And from that goes development. You talk about railway, the railway plan that we put on the ground. It did not allow it to move, in, move forward an inch. That is its understanding of development. Even power. So, not to talk of other infrastructure. So, leadership, governance, and development. These three must be got right. And if they are got right, then you must be able to make progress. If that is the situation, I had the opportunity and wonderful advantage of meeting and mixing and interacting with the great and great mind, great men and women, leaders in all spheres of human endeavor. And I want to tell you what I learned from two of them. Lee Kuan Yu and Helmut Schmidt. When I first went to Singapore in 
66. It was a patch of sand and small uh, Chinatown. Singapore has just been kicked out or got itself out of Malaysian Federation. Virtually no hope. Lee started off. The second time I went was 1974. Lee had got its bearing right. And he was moving on. By the time I went again in early 1990, Singapore has already got to autopilot. And um, I went with about 35 young Africans. What happened was we had something we call Interaction Council and Lee was a member. And I said, Lee, will you come to Nigeria and meet young African leaders? He said, look, my friend, if I go against the uh, time zone, I'm no use for the next 48 hours. Why don't you bring them to Singapore? I said, bring them to Singapore? Over 30 people? said, we pay. And he paid for them and I took them to Singapore. And the young men and young women that we went were anxious to ask. He stood, he, he stood with us for the two days. They were anxious to know and they asked what is the magic? By then he had not written his book from third world to first world. And what did he say? He said, we did a few things right and we continue to do them right. We did a few things right and we continue to do them right. And I told those young people, I said, well, that is the take away. Think, what is your country doing right? And if you know what your country is doing right, does your country continue to do them right? To deepen and widen what they are doing right? And I said to them, we in Nigeria, we did a few things right. We did UPE right, but we didn't continue to do them right. We did basic uh, primary health right, but we didn't continue to do them right. We did right to try and go for iron and steel, but we didn't continue to do them right. In fact, I have a very funny story about that one. When I left government, in 1979, those people who were building the Ajaokuta came to me in Abeokuta and said, you haven't handed over correctly. I say, how dare you? What the hell do you mean? Now they say, yes, uh, because the people you handed over for, uh, to said you should come and bribe them for building the uh, Ajaokuta plant. And we told them that you are, you are in fact borrowing money from us to build the Ajaokuta uh, steel plant. Should we also borrow you money to pay, to bribe you? I drove them away and I went to report to the then president. Not much came out of it. So, leadership governance, and development. And to me, what is development? Your ability to get for yourself what is very important and crucial for your own living and to ward off what is inimical. You must not only create for yourself what is absolutely necessary, but you must also be able to ward off 
what will be inimical. Can we ward off what is inimical? Lamkela was telling us, most of us live on received ideas, packaged. In fact, at one time, we talk of uh, uh, technology transfer. Where, is that? Where does that come from? Technology you have to develop, you have to steal, you have to borrow, you have to unwrap or, 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 or unravel it. Nobody transfers technology to you. And because we are talking of uh, technology transfer, well, when we are trying to get something, they put technology transfer bill, they add it to it and make it more expensive. Uh, if you want technology transfer, okay, you get it. And there wasn't anything being transferred. Now let me talk about Helmut Schmidt, what I learned from him. Helmut, again, from the same group. Normally when we went to our meetings, we will sit down and drink. I love my apple juice. Some of them will drink brandy, some of them will drink uh, wine. And one day, I think it was in Hamburg, I said, Helmut, you know, you people, you are not being kind to us. He said, Olu, what do you mean by we people are not being kind to you? I said, look, in the economic arrangement, he said, what do you want? I said, look, we, everything is loaded against us. And he said to me what he will not say in public. He said, oh, look, we devise capitalism for ourselves, not for you. I said, Hemo, don't you think in the interest of common humanity, you should look at us more, um, more leniently. He said, Olu, bring your economics book and show me where common humanity is a factor of uh, factor of production and economic uh, development. And he was right. He was absolutely right. But the international community is not harsh and ruthless. If you do what you need to do. My experience with debt relief, we should talk about uh, Yamkala. It's an experience. And Ambassador Christopher Kolade is here. When we were negotiating debt relief, I was with him in London on one location. I think I must have been talking to Chirac for 30 minutes. Oh, no. Not to an hour. Chris is saying more than an hour. And what was happening? I said, Ngozi, you stay with the Minister of Finance until I get the yes that I need from Chirac. You just hang on to his Minister of Finance. And I will not let go until I got yes. And I got yes. Now, and then Britain decided to lead our cause, to take up our cause, because they were, uh, they realized that we were very serious with our reform program. And that was it. So, leadership, governance, and development. Helmut Schmidt 
said another thing to me. I started something, an NGO I call Africa Leadership Forum. Some people have gone through it. Okay. And when I was thinking of establishing Africa Leadership Forum, my identity was in ECA. So I went to him. I said, look, I'm thinking of this. And he said, what is your aim? What is your objective? I said, my objective is the successor generation of leaders. So he laughed. I said, Bayo, what are you laughing about? He said, if you don't do something about your incumbent leaders, your successful generation of leaders won't have anything to succeed to. So that had to make me to change what, how we decided to run the African Leadership Forum. So to make sure we had something for incumbent leaders, I decided I will bring successful leaders in all walks of life to come and interact with African leaders well, just for one day because you cannot have them even for AU or OAU at that time, you cannot have them for more than one day. After the, the, uh, the opening day, the second day, half of them are gone. <clears throat> so, and I brought Hermo Schmidt, Jimmy Callahan, Beatrudo, uh, Bob McNamara. Uh, this, this is the sort of people I brought. And when Hermo Schmidt came, Hermo Schmidt said, and he said to them, for leadership in Africa and for development of Africa, leaders must have modicum of economic knowledge and it's right. Now some of our leaders don't even understand what supply and demand means. And I thought that is basic in economic uh, uh, understanding. They don't even understand what it means. So, <laughs> leadership, governance, and development. You talk about the hope. I am an incurable optimist about Africa and about Nigeria. And there is a lot of evidence to feel that way. The time is of essence. Time is of essence. And um, it is that time I must say that as things, I, I would say since the beginning of this millennium and this century, after we have lost the, particularly the last two decades of the last century, I think with the transformation of OAU to AU, the establishment of NEPAD and APRM, and all the things that African leaders on their own did for themselves, I think there have been some improvement. Some improvement. 30 years ago, democracy is a reality. Today, lack of it is a reality. I think that is progress. Election results are still disputed, and election 
uh, conduct itself or process is tampered with. But I have said that election results that have been disputed and been left to be decided by the judiciary, an independent judiciary, if we can get that, uh, is better than no elections at all. And um, judging by what happened last year, Gambia in our own West African subregion, uh, Zimbabwe with a pinch of salt. Because I give a lecture in Oxford and somebody asks, what is Zimbabwe? Is it a coup or a change of government or a democratic process? And I did say, what you saw in Zimbabwe, like we've seen in a few other countries, is that the no government by unconstitutional means that is part and parcel of AU Constitutive Act is working. You can see how much the Zimbabwe military kept saying it was not a coup. It was not a coup. It was not a coup. And what was it if it wasn't a coup? And if it wasn't a coup, why do you have to step be telling us it wasn't a coup? And they asked me, and I said, look, the Zimbabwean authorities have said it was not a coup. But I know it is a mini coup. <clears throat> because all they were trying to avoid is for them not to be kicked out of the, EU, uh, of the AU, which will have happened. But we have seen what it is. Now, <clears throat> I have seen, as I said, a bit of change, a bit of improvement. I went to uh, a president the other day, and he was, now four years I was with him, he was talking about minerals. Last year I went, he was talking about agriculture. And he said, you know, I went to Ethiopia. They have white sesame seed, which sells better in the uh, international market. I have got it. 25 years ago, you won't hear that from an African leader. What you will probably hear from is uh, uh, collaborators and his official will be, you have nothing to learn from country A or leader B. And he's a fool who says he has nothing to learn from anybody. A great fool. Now, African leaders are trying to learn from themselves. My brother from South Africa, I came from your country yesterday, and I was asking the question, I was asked the question, Hey, how is Nigeria and South Africa doing? They quoted what I have said about Nigeria and South Africa in the past. I said South Africa is managing its political problem, and Nigeria will manage its own. And it is when we are able to do that successfully that the transition process that we are still in and every country in Africa is still in the process of transition that we will get there. And um, so I see improvement, a little bit of improvement in leadership. You can talk, you talk about Kagame. Uh, some people will say he's undemocratic. He changed his... Uh, Constitution by democratic means. I don't see what is undemocratic about that. You can talk about Watara in our own sub region. 
You can talk about Ethiopia. And this last, uh, last uh, month I was in Ethiopia, and I said to the Prime Minister, what is the problem? And he was candid. He said, you know, we were following. The world was telling us and we were telling ourselves we were growing by 9%, 8%, but we left an important segment behind. It is that important segment that we have left behind that is now crying foul and we now have to pay attention to them. So, they were mindful of GDP growth. They were not mindful of the welfare and well-being of all the people of uh, Ethiopia. Even technology and innovation, we should talk about, is coming up. AU is talking rightly, and um, we are not there, but I believe we will be there. The youth, about three years ago, three, four years ago, I gathered 500 youth in Addis Ababa a couple of days before the AU meeting. And I said to them, look, you work out among yourself. I got AU to give us two hours during their uh, lunch on the day of opening for the youth to come and talk to them after their own conference. And they told our leaders what they wanted from them, what they wanted from the private sector, what they wanted from the civil society, and what they are also ready to do for themselves. We have never had that such a situation with the AU leaders or OAU leaders. So we are making progress. I think we need to make, do more. Next month, AU will sign Continental Free, Free Trade Zone Agreement. I think it's on the 24th of next month. That will be a great, great move forward for our leaders and for all of us. We have already got AU passport, which will be of general use before the end of this month. I wanted to go to an African country. I wanted to go to an African country, and I was told that I didn't have a visa. I was invited by the government of the country for a conference. And of course, because I didn't have visa, I couldn't go. If that could happen to me, then I wonder what could happen to ordinary Africans. So I believe we are moving away from that. The Africa Development Bank set up about three years ago what they call infrastructure fund, 50 billion, and they are managing it. Now these are signs of improvement. Not good enough, but we are making progress. Now, we come home to Nigeria. Namkela, I don't think anybody will uh, disagree with you with all the so nice things you said about Nigeria. But we are not there. And we will be deceiving ourselves if we do not tell ourselves some home truth. You know, in my part of the world, we say we, when two brothers go inside the room and they come out and they are giggling. 
they haven't told themselves home truth. But when they come out and they frighten their face and they don't talk to you sitting down, then they have really told themselves some home truth. We have to tell ourselves home truth in Nigeria. We have to. What are the, some of the home truths? Diversity must be acknowledged and must be appreciated. Diversity. <laughs> Nigeria is what it is because of that great diversity that we have. That's what makes us the largest population of the black race in the world. I like it. But it should not, we shouldn't make it a liability. We should make it an asset. Well, I have talked about infrastructure. That is very, very important. The basis of our development must be adequate provision of infrastructure. Transition. We cannot fold our hands and think that we are there yet. We are not there yet. Our, the first generation of leaders, immediate pre-independence and post-independence, whatever you may say about them, they gave us independence. They transited, or they were, there was transition from the colonial power to the uh, local leaders. Within their knowledge, their experience, and their exposure, they did their best. Then the military came. Another transition. Transition to military. Then we transition out of the military. And we have also transitioned from one party regime, change of regime within one party to change of regime between one party and another. But we have to transition to popular movement and give the people of this country the feeling, the belief that the power lies in their hand. We have, until we are able to do that, we are not there yet. We are not there yet. Security. What are we doing about it? And it shouldn't be an emotional issue. We all need security. But don't tell me that what works in the colonial days is what you will now bring to work today. It doesn't happen that way. Or to tell me that, oh yes, it is my culture. Culture is meant to be dynamic. <laughs> what is your culture? When I was military head of state, I think we make a law that if you are going to ride motorcycle, you must wear steel helmet. No, no, that, that it sounds too reason. May you so rest in peace. Rimi then got up and said, wearing a steel helmet is not their culture. 
So I quickly called him. I said, Rimi, riding motorcycle too is not your culture. <laughs> I said, Rimi, your culture of wearing turban, at that time you ride donkey. Now that you have to ride motorcycle, your culture has to move. It had to change. Um, I think Obama was the one who said what we need is strong institutions and not strong leaders. I disagree with him. We need both strong institutions and strong leaders. If you don't have strong leaders, they will not be able to establish strong institutions. And even if strong institutions are established and your, leader, your leaders are weak, those strong institutions will be eroded. They will become weak. But we need strong institutions and of course we need leaders that knows their onion. I will not leave the issue of education. And this is very, very important for us here in Nigeria. I was looking into the level of education as given in the statistics the other day. In the Southwest, in the Southwest, it's about 84, 85. In the Southeast, it's about 83, 82. In the Northeast, is less than 30 in the same country. And you can see why Boko Haram is rife in the south, uh, in the nor northeast. And it speaks for itself. Education. President Kagame was telling me the other day, he said when he was going to school, he couldn't have money to buy slate, ordinary slate. He was writing on his thigh. His thigh was his slate. But he had education. And that makes a world of difference. That is what has made him what he is today. So education is very important. The last point I have here is what I call common prosperity. In our own country, if you think of yourself alone and you do not think of others, it's height of stupidity. In Africa, if Nigeria thinks of itself alone and does not think of the rest of Africa, we will be an oasis in the midst of desert and it will be height of stupidity. Let me end on the quote from Einstein. Einstein said, if you are doing the same thing and you expect different result, that is height of folly. We must stop being, being foolish in Africa and particularly in Nigeria. It cannot continue to be business as usual.